So here I am in London, and wow, what an amazing place with lots to see and do. London sure does look like a place that has a lot of history, with some truly amazing infrastructure, which is totally different to my part of the world. I mean, where I live, there's absolutely nowhere that looks anything like this. I mean, look at me chilling out here at Buckingham Palace. Yet while on this little adventure of mine, I sure did feel like an Australian YouTuber in London. And this got me thinking about one of my favourite movies, An American Werewolf in London, the classic monster movie from 1981, which is both a hilarious comedy, but also a terrifying and shocking horror movie, where a young American tourist finds himself bearing the werewolf curse which also, without a doubt, gave us the greatest werewolf transformation scene of all time. Thanks, Rick Baker, you bloody legend. In fact, I love this movie so much, when I very first arrived in the UK, I was actually in the London Underground, where I said this. I can assure you, this is not in the least bit amusing. Yep, literally the first thing I did when I arrived in this country was reference an American werewolf in London, be that the uptight underground victim. This movie was, of course, the brainchild of its writer and director, John Landis. And today, seeing how I'm in London, we're going to explore his original script to see just how different it is to the final film, and if this old script would have made for a better movie, or if the movie we got is perfect the way that it is. So, let's check it out. Yeah, that'll be a great idea. Oh, and video coming soon. 10 things that you didn't know about this guy's hat. So unlike the theatrical version of An American Werewolf in London, which starts on the Northern England moors while Blue Moon plays, creating a really strange and eerie atmosphere, in the script, we literally start on the moon. Namely, a footprint on the moon, which I'm guessing is Neil Armstrong's footprint. It doesn't really specify. The camera pans away from the moon, where we then get the title, An American Werewolf in London and the camera travels further away from the moon, all while the credits roll, and the song played in the background is not Blue Moon, but Moon Shadow by Cat Stevens. Time being followed by a moon shadow. Moon After the credits roll, the next scene is very much how we see in the final film. Jack and David arrive at East Proctor in the sheep truck, only in the script it wasn't daylight, but nighttime. Just like the movie, Jack and David make it to the slaughtered lamb, and the script even deep dives into how unappealing the patrons of the establishment are, describing them as unsavory, even going as far as suggesting that the town folk here are inbred. Heck, one of these townspeople would even go on to rent a house with Mike, Vivian, and Neil. And the next turn of events pretty much go just like how the movie does. Jack and David anger the locals by questioning the star on the wall. The boys end up on the moors. They get attacked by the wolf beast. Jack dies and David is rescued by the slaughtered lamb guys and wakes up in a hospital in London. In the scene where Mr. Collins, the American ambassador, and Dr. Hirsch visit David and informs him that Jack has died, Mr. Collins tells David that Jack's body has been air freighted back to New York. This piece of information puts David into a rage where he says, quote, You don't crate and ship Jack like some side of beef. Who the hell are you people? In which both Dr. Hirsch and Nurse Price wrestle with David to hold him down while he's being sedated. Later, we see David have one of his very strange and terrifying dreams, where he's running in the forest just like an animal, and he subsequently kills a deer. Only the script explains that David doesn't just eat the deer, but he howls in triumph. David then wakes up, and he's attended by Nurse Gallagher. You know, the nurse who said, I've had a look. She gives David some pills and water, and informs him that that night she's going to a movie theatre with Alex, aka Nurse Price. 
David asks, what are they going to see? Nurse Gallagher tells him, it's an American movie about the Mafia called See You Next Wednesday, which is hilarious, as in the final film, See You Next Wednesday was an adult movie. Throughout all this chit-chat, David is still disturbed by the dream that he just had, where he asks Gallagher if she suffers from bad dreams too, to which she replies, sure, everyone does. David then asks, yes, but does everyone kill Bambi? David then falls asleep from the pills that he had just had. Nurse Gallagher repeatedly thinks about this thing that David just said about killing Bambi, and she just can't make any sense out of it. There is also another character who was removed from the final film called Mrs. Hobbs, who informs Alex that David needs to take his pills and that he's not eating enough food with the meals that he is being given, unlike the theatrical movie where he isn't eating at all. The scene where Alex force feeds David is also a little flirtier, as it describes that in that moment, David and Alex are sizing each other up, and the scene ends with David asking if he can have some milk too. <laughs> Sorry. We then get the nightmare sequence where David sees his undead self in the hospital bed in the woods. Well, in the script, this scene is kind of different. It starts with David running around hearing the death screams of Jack. He's trying to look for Jack, but just can't find him anywhere. He also hears the screaming howls of the wolf monster. David then finds the hospital bed in the middle of the woods. Only Alex isn't there. David goes up to the bed and pulls off the sheet to see his own dead body on the bed. Yeah, that's some scary sheet right there. And just like the movie, David's eyes open to reveal yellow wolf eyes and a mouth full of fangs. In fact, the nightmare is so extreme and terrifying to David, it causes him to scream in terror, where the whole hospital can hear him, where Mrs. Hobbs goes to restrain him. The next day, David and Dr. Hirsch are talking about David's nightmares as seen in the film, where David once again really tries to persuade Dr. Hirsch that he and Jack were attacked by a wolf. But Dr. Hirsch kind of loses his temper and compares David's story to the Hound of the Baskervilles in that it's a fake. But Dr. Hirsch then feels bad for raising his voice. I guess you can't really blame him as he's a man of science and David is, well, talking about werewolves. So Nurse Price is sitting with David as he lays in bed. She reads him some of her book, A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. But beforehand, they have a really melancholy conversation about how David now only dreams about death and how Jack was David's very best friend. Just like in the movie, David has a dream about the stormtrooper demon wolves attacking his family in New York. But the dream within a dream that immediately takes place afterwards doesn't happen in the original script. Instead, David wakes up and asks Alex to go back to New York with him. Yeah, it's kind of weird. In fact, Alex feels just as weird as I do, and she really is bewildered. And David tells her, I'm serious, you don't know me, and I know nothing about you. We have a perfect relationship. Yeah, once again, it's really weird and kind of out of character, as David is usually humble and level-headed. So I'm glad this discussion was deleted. Jack turns up to warn David and inform him that he's a werewolf. And in this script, a shocked David throws even more insults at Jack than he does in the film, calling him meatloaf, which he does call him later on in the film, as well as a hamburger and a zombie. And he doesn't like that he's sharing his breakfast with the living dead. Yeah, that quote was used. As well as repeatedly telling him to shut up. Yeah, I guess being informed that you're a werewolf will do that. We then get to Alex's apartment, where Alex and David engage in soapy shower sex, where we get a montage of them doing the spicy tango. About halfway through though, Alex brings up David's claims that Jack had visited him. At first, David insists that he wasn't hallucinating. Alex convinces him that it was a hallucination by kissing his... Um... Slaughtered lamb. To which David says, quote, Okay, okay, I'm properly reassured. <laughs> yeah, look, it's all very much animal house humour going on here. Oh, and after all the Humpty Dumpty, David gets a visit from Jack, who's even more decomposed, just like the film. 
The next few scenes also play out like the movie. Dr. Hirsch visits the slaughtered lamb. Alex goes to work, leaving David to be restlessly pacing around the flat. He turns on the TV, only there isn't that news of the world advert about a model called Naughty Nina, who is actually a real life model called Nina Carter, but two soccer games. Okay, football games, as to not annoy the Brits. And quote, a truly insepid children's program. And Credence's Bad Moon Rising isn't featured in the original script, but instead David sings the Frank Sinatra song, Moon River. We then get the werewolf transformation scene, which the script describes as being really painful, where, quote, new bolts of agonizing pain rack through David's body. Oh, and we also learn that the book he's reading just as the transformation started was the, as mentioned, A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, which Alex read to him in an earlier scene. I suppose it makes sense that John Landis would have an interest in the 1889 novel, which was written by Mark Twain. As like an American werewolf in London, A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court is about an American who is in unfamiliar surroundings in England, under exceptional circumstances. So the David Wolf kills and eats the young couple, and the homeless men, and the, I can assure you that this is the least bit amusing guy in the underground. Where in the original script, this guy can sense that he's being stalked. He doesn't know why or how, but he just knows that he's being hunted. In fact, the script describes the werewolf stalking this man, and just how much the wolf wants to eat him, and that we were to see the wolf's drooling, panting black tongue. Like, this wolf really wants an uptight, random guy at London Underground Happy Meal, where just like the movie, a chase ensues, and once again, the next few scenes play out like the rest of the movie. David wakes up at the zoo, makes his way back to Alex's apartment. They both leave for the hospital to see Dr. Hirsch. David learns about the killings and tries to get arrested. We then get one of my favourite lines where this lady says, I don't know, perhaps he thinks it's a prank. He then calls his little sister back in the States, where he then sees Jack at a movie theatre. The script explains that Jack has rotted so much now, he's pretty much just a grinning skull. Now, according to a website called WalterFilm.com, there was a version of the script where David tries to cut his wrists, just as we see in the movie, but because he's a werewolf, he can't physically pierce his skin, as if he's now indestructible or immortal. Whereas in the movie, David just couldn't bring himself to do it. I'm glad this was changed, or otherwise later when the werewolf was shot, how would the bullets have been able to pierce through his skin? Anywho... Jack, David, and the rest of David's victims sit in the theatre, discussing how David can self-terminate, where David then starts to transform. Oh, and in the script, this movie theatre isn't an adult theatre, but just a regular normal one, where three young kids, the eldest being nine, run up to David and watch his transformation in fascination, where he screams at them to get away. But no, these kids are just way too interested with what's going on in front of them. Where, of course, David wolfs it up and eats them. Yeah, in the original script, the wolf actually kills kids. The English bobbies turn up and try to lock the theatre. And from here, the script is pretty much beat by beat with how things unfold in the movie. The wolf bursts out of the theatre shutter doors and causes chaos on the streets of London. Police with guns corner the David werewolf down a dark alley. Alex turns up to talk to the wolf, where the wolf is then fired upon, revealing David's lifeless body on the ground. Only in the original script, it didn't feature the line of Alex telling David that she loves him. And I'm really glad that that was added, as it adds a layer of tragedy to the piece. And when you think about it, although there are tons of debates as to whether or not an American werewolf in London is a horror or a comedy, I mean, really? It's a tragic love story in every sense of the terminology. So that was the original script for An American Wealth in London, and it was very similar to the final film, but the odd changes here and there were very fascinating, and had this script been used, I think that An American Wealth in London still would have become a horror movie classic. So back on my trip to London, I had a wonderful time, and I actually got quite sunburnt on my scalp due to all the sightseeing. Now, if someone was to tell me that within a year, my house in Australia would be flooded, and that I'll get sunstroke in England, I would think that they were crazy. 
but that's the dimension we're currently living in. In addition to that, London is massive! It's huge! I couldn't believe how big London was! I had no idea it would be this big. I mean, I'm from a big country and England's a little country, so I thought, yeah, I've got this covered. I'll get my way around. Easy peasy poo. But no, London is huge. But thankfully, I didn't get lost. But I swear at one stage, I ended up at Hogwarts. I mean, look at that. That's totally Hogwarts, right? And I even made it to Abbey Road to do something millions and millions of other tourists do, cross the street. Anyway, I'm Minty, and here I am crossing Abbey Road, but the guy filming filmed it the wrong way round. <laughs> and for good measure, this is what crossing Abbey Road looks like from a first-person perspective. See ya!